So we're continuing our series in the kingdom parables. We're trying to figure out when Jesus brings his kingdom, what that kingdom ethic looks like, how to be involved in the kingdom, how to advance the kingdom, and what it all is all about. And we're continuing that. You're going to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 12, but I want to start with this question. When you go to God, what problems do you tend to take to him? Now, that does not assume that you're a Christian. Even if you're not a believer, even if you're not a believer, you don't pretend to believe in God. There are times when things get really, really bad. Even people who don't believe in God, and they will acknowledge they don't believe in God, find themselves praying and asking God to intervene somehow. So regardless of which end of the spectrum you're on, where you have, uh, you're really, really solid in your faith, you've been following Jesus for a long time, you're not even sure who Jesus is, or you consider yourself to be agnostic or atheist. If and when that time comes when you're in pain and you cry out, God help me, God help me, what kind of problems do you tend to go to him with? Now, this is the crowd participation segment of the sermon. What would drive a person to cry out to God? What's one thing? Health. Health. What else? Pain. pain. What kind of pain? Okay, could be loss, could be emotional pain, could be physical pain. What else? Loneliness. Loneliness. One of the first things in the first service, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm fishing. I'm looking for the, the answer that I want. I'll keep going until I get it. But if you're not going to deliver it, a lot of times people will cry out to God when they're in all sorts of different kinds of pain, one of which includes financial pain. And one of the things that we need to understand is that our problems might not be the problem. Whenever you go to a doctor and you have a headache, you go because there is a symptom that is causing you to realize there's something not right with my body. So we go to God because we're typically in pain. We're not sure what the pain is caused by. We just know that we're in pain. We're going to take a look at a scenario right now in Luke chapter 13 where somebody comes to Jesus with a perceived problem. And it is a problem. It is a problem. Here we have in verse 13, someone in the crowd says to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So we have from this, we have a relational problem. But what other problem do we have? What else is here? There's a financial problem. And those two are connected. Those two are connected. He comes to Jesus with a problem. Now in Jesus' day, what was common, you didn't have a civil magistrate. You didn't have civil courts. You had local synagogues. And the rabbis were the ones who were the experts in, in Old Testament law. And they would, they would basically render a judgment. Here's what's fair. So Jesus, although technically is not, uh, not a local rabbi, he's a traveling teacher. And he's recognized and perceived to be a rabbi. So this individual comes to him and says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. The scenario, most likely, we don't know the background, but in Jesus' day, when, when, a, when a father passed away, the estate goes to the children, but the older son receives two-thirds of the estate, and the younger son is to receive a third of the state. We don't know the details here, but presumably what's happening is that the older brother is holding out. So well, why would he hold out? It's if he's if give him the third. Well, it's also understood in that day that what is optimal, what is optimal is that the estate not be divided up and sold off so that the one third could go to the younger brother and the two thirds could go to the older, but rather the estate stay intact with the older brother running the business or running the farm and the younger brother staying on and participating in the family business, keeping all the assets together. Make sense? So more than likely what's happening here is the younger brother's like, I don't want to run the family business. I want my share and I want to go. Make sense? So that's probably what's going on. So let's take a look at how Jesus responds. Jesus responds with, he said to the man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? Now that's an interesting statement. How many of you are vaguely aware that Jesus is a judge? Okay, it says in John, he says out of his own mouth in John chapter 5 verse 22, that the Father has given me all authority on heaven and earth to judge. Well, which is it? Are you a judge or not you a judge? Uh, here's what he's not saying. He's not saying, I don't have the authority to judge. Here's what he's saying. My purpose in coming to earth is not to settle your family squabble over how much money you should have in the event of your father's death. I came not to get you stuff, but to get you eternal life. 
That's the issue here. His priorities are not making sure that everybody's family squabbles are solved. His problems is atoning for the sins of the world and taking care of a sin debt and giving to, giving to us his righteousness. So he says, man who made me a judge or arbiter over you. And then he drops the bomb here. He says, okay, you've come to me with a problem that financial, and that problem is you perceive to be financial and relational. You want justice. I want what's right. My third of the estate. He says, that's not really your problem. He says, here's what your problem is. Oh, by the way, it's not that there isn't an injustice, but you have a bigger problem going on. And that's verse 15. He says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So what you have here is an individual who's in an amount of pain. There's an injustice going on. He doesn't feel that his brother is doing him right. And there's also a, probably a perceived financial dilemma going on that if he doesn't get this inheritance, he's afraid that he won't be provided for. So there's worry and anxiety about a lack of money, and there's also hurt feelings about an injustice. Those two things are going on. Those are symptomatic. Jesus is saying, no, your primary problem is covetousness. Your primary problem is covetousness. And he says, be on your guard. The phrase, be on your guard, is, it likens back to Genesis 4, when you have Cain and Abel, and they, both, they, they bring their offerings, they bring their gifts, and, and, and Abel's is deemed acceptable as an act of worship, and Cain's is rejected. Cain's is rejected. And, and Cain is ticked off because God accepted his brothers, and he's grousing, and he's upset, and God comes to him, and he says, be careful, sin is crouching at your door, its desire is to have you. It's kind of, and that's the way sin is. You, you know, we don't feel it necessarily, but it desires to have us. And covetousness is a sneaky sin. Covetousness, it's the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. It's a sneaky sin. We don't tend to think we're coveting. One of the sins, which is apparently obvious, is adultery, sexual immorality. Nobody's like, oh my gosh, you're not my wife. How did this happen? That doesn't happen. Yeah. It doesn't sneak up on you like that. Uh, Covetousness is very much like that. Most people don't think they are covetous. They can recognize it in other people, but they can't see it in themselves. So why Paul says in, in, uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, put to death whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to look at what it means to guard against covetousness in the parable of the rich fool, which he's about ready to tell. So he said, be on your guard against all forms of covetousness. And now he's going to tell us a parable that links back to that warning to guard our hearts. Two things we're going to look at. Understanding what covetousness is. That's the first thing. We're going to do that by looking quick quickly at a definition, but also the parable as a, as a means of illustrating what it looks like to covet. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to, to deal with it. Paul says, put it to death. We're going we're gonna to see how to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and stab it through the heart of covetousness. And hopefully we won't bleed out in the process. So that's the goal. That's the goal. So let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Let's pray and jump right into the text. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship freely in this country, and we thank you for the privilege to do so. We thank you for the Word of God, which is sharper than a double-edged sword, and we pray that you would use it to, uh, to do surgery, precise surgery on our own hearts. Show us where we are in danger of not guarding our hearts and becoming covetous, and uh, Lord, show us the dangers, but also show us the remedy. Show us the remedy through the gospel and your great generosity and what you have done by sending your Son to die on the cross and give us eternal life. And also, Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would open up our eyes uh, to understand the gospel, to believe the gospel, and to apply the gospel. Work in our hearts this morning for the glory of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Okay, so let's, let's seek to understand. First of all, in verse tw or, uh, chapter 12, chapter 12 in verse 15, Jesus says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So the word, which is translated into the English, covetousness, 
Here's the Greek word. It's plenexia. It means a strong desire to acquire more and more, more and more material possessions or to possess more things than other people have. All of that irrespective of what we actually need. What we actually need. Uh, synonyms, greed, avarice, or as it's translated here in the ESV, covetousness. Now it's important to notice, look back at verse 15 if you have your Bibles open. Uh, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. The word all comes before covetousness. So that means that it doesn't necessarily have to just be about money and stuff. It's stuff that you desire and think that you have to have to have, mean, to, to, to have a meaningful life that, that you don't have or you don't believe you have enough of. So it could be stuff. It could be money. It could be a whole host of things. So that's what covetousness is. So now let's look at the parable which illustrates the definition. The parable, right after he says, beware, be on your guard against all forms of covetousness for life doesn't, doesn't the meaning of life is not about your possessions or the abundance of, of all your material goods. He says, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and goods. Okay, first of all, first of all, what produced the abundance from the text? What's the text say? The land, the land produced. Now, he obviously planted, he sowed, he planted, but a farmer doesn't cause the crops to grow. God produced the rain, God produced the sun, God produced the fertile soil. He had to do some work, but it was the land that brought about the harvest. Now, as he sees this, this, this bumper crop come in, he realizes that his storage facilities, his grain silos, if you will, are not adequate to, 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 to handle all of the grain. That, this is a good problem to have. If you're in business, if you're a farmer, this is a good problem to have, to have not enough storage, not enough storage. So his solution, and he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and I will build larger ones and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. Okay, now whose grain is it? According to him, my grain. My grain, my goods, my barns. Okay, a lot of eyes, a lot of mys. Okay, now let's keep moving. Verse 19, and I'll say to my soul, who actually does that, by the way? <laughs> actually, all of us do. This is, this is what we call self-talk. We talk to ourselves all the time about a great many things. Have you ever been mad at your spouse or mad at somebody and, and ticked off? And you say to yourself what you're going to say to them. Yeah, you know, that's, you know the drill. That's how it works. So he says to himself, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Where have you heard that before? Those of you who have been attending Grace since December or longer. Okay, that's Solomon. That's the book of Ecclesiastes. When you define the meaning of life as the acquisition of everything under the sun and only under the sun, you tend to believe that the meaning of life is to eat, drink, and be merry. There's nothing wrong with eating. There's nothing wrong with drinking. And there's nothing wrong with being merry. But if you define the meaning of life in the acquisition of food and drink, you will be sorely disappointed. So here's what he does. He gets all soul we can kick back and relax. We'll build bigger barns. This crop will be the defining year. And now I can sit back. I can put my feet up. I can relax. I can eat and drink. And it's all about me, 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 my stuff, my goods, my pleasure. You, you, see, the, you see the connection there? And then you have verse 20. Contrast. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you've prepared, whose will they be? 
So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. This is right out of the book of Ecclesiastes where the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, listen, you can acquire all of these things for yourself and here's the deal. You're gonna die. And guess what? The people you leave the stuff to are gonna squander everything you worked for. You can't even enjoy it. You'll be dead. And here it is, right here in the parable. He's bringing out the wisdom of Ecclesiastes in parable form and you see it played out. And he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You can see in verse 21 that played out. He says to himself, my barn, my grain, my toil, my, 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 I'm going to do this. I, 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 my, my, my. The problem is that he is laying up treasure for whom? What's, his, his work is, is, is to benefit whom? Himself. His surplus is to benefit whom? Himself. He views everything that he's, everything in his life as a means to an end, and the end is his own pleasure and his own comfort. By the way, there's nothing wrong with enjoying life, and there's nothing wrong with desiring comfort. But if everything else is excluded, that's a problem. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich, here's the contrast, towards God. He has an under the sun mentality. In other words, everything that he's doing is doing just to please himself and he does not have in view the responsibility and the calling to live a kingdom life which benefits others and gives glory to God. That's not on his radar. And so God calls him on it and rebukes him and calls him a fool. By the way, fool here does not mean someone who is stupid. Someone is stupid. It doesn't mean a lack of intelligence. It means someone who refuses to acknowledge the reality of God's perspective, that you and I are not here in this world for 70 years or 80 years or 90 years and that's it, but rather we are here for 70, 80, 90 years or less or maybe more and that is a starting point that prepares us for eternally glorifying God. If you do not live life in light of the reality that which is eternity, it is foolishness. It's, it's to ignore that which is true. Now, you could be very intellectually gifted and still be a fool. So this is not saying this person is stupid, just foolish. Okay, now let's take a look at, at, at understanding covetousness in terms of its effects. The effects, if we do not, if we do not, what Jesus said, if we don't guard against covetousness and we just let it play out, let it play out, there's at least three consequences. There's probably more, but at least three. First of all is potential, and I say potential, separation from God. God calls him out, your life will be demanded of you, and what good is all this stuff going to do you? In other words, he is being condemned, he is being judged, he's being called out. Next week we are going to see the, the, uh, the end result of that as we look at the parable of Lazarus and the rich man and talk about the subject of eternal judgment, hell. So there's that. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who struggles with coveting is going to be eternally separated from God, but that is a potential outcome. That is a potential outcome. More on that next week. That is certainly a potential, and that, is, that would be a negative effect. Uh, the second thing is fear and anxiety. If you don't guard your heart against covetousness, Fear and anxiety are always going to creep in because when, how much is enough? It doesn't matter how much you have. If you don't have enough, you're worried that you will suffer. If you do have enough, what are you worried about? That you're going to lose what you have. You, you can't avoid it. If you covet, you will be riddled with anxiety. Either way, the poor or the rich will be riddled with anxiety, worried about what I don't have and how am I going to get it, or I've got it, worried about how I'm going to store it and how am I going to prevent from losing it. Either way, it's worried. Take a look at the, at the verses that follow this parable in Luke chapter 12, just touching on a couple verses. Right away in verse 22, he says to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on. For is life, uh, for life is more than food, body, and more than clothing. Now, why do you suppose Jesus said that? Don't be anxious about your life. Why? Do you, why? Because they are 
worried. Yes. He's saying don't be anxious because they are riddled with anxiety. This guy comes in and says, my brother won't give me the inheritance. I demand what's mine. He says, your problem is not a lack of resources. Your problem is covetousness. And because of that, you are worried. And so are the rest of the disciples. They're milling around. Remember last week? I think it was last week. Peter says, uh, uh, well, maybe it was a couple weeks ago. These parables all run together to me. He comes and he says, well, we've left everything. There's a sense of like, we've left everything. How am I going to be provided for? Jesus is like, I got it. I got it. We'll take care of it. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And if you keep reading all the way through verse 33, you hear, don't worry, don't worry, don't be anxious, don't worry, don't be anxious, don't worry, don't be anxious. And then in verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, so there's a constant admonition. Don't worry. If you're focused on stuff, you will worry. You can't help it. You can't help it. Either you'll focus on what you don't have and you'll be anxious that you're not, you're not ever going to acquire it or you'll focus on you, what you do have and you'll be worried that you're going to lose it. You'll be worried that you're going to lose it. 2008, a lot of you lost money in, in, in your, out of your retirement and, and that caused you a great deal of stress. Now, those of you that didn't have a retirement, it didn't worry you at all because you didn't lose anything. But those of you that didn't have a retirement, you're worried about the fact that you don't have a retirement. And how am I going to live? So either way, you had it and you lost it. You're worried. You don't have it and you're worried. You're just worried. About what? Stuff you don't have. Stuff you do have. Stuff you lost. You get the idea. I think that horse is dead. We can move on. <laughs> Third, there's strife and conflict. What's the original occasion for this guy coming to Jesus? What's his beef? He's ticked off at his brother. I want you to tell him what is right and he needs to do it. This is super common. Anytime the father or matriarch or patriarch of a, of a family dies and they have means and now the estate needs to be divvied up, there is nothing more common than siblings who used to get along to suddenly not get along. Why? Because now they are arguing about what to do with the estate. I want to sell dad's farm. I don't think we should sell the farm. I think we should keep the farm. I want the money. No, I, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. You, didn't, you don't care about this. You never care. What? They loved one another 10 minutes ago before they sat down in the lawyer's office to talk about the estate. This is super common. Strife and conflict. Turn your Bibles to John, or rather James chapter 4. Take a look at what James says. He diagnoses the problem. He says, well, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you don't have, so you murder. You covet, you can't obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You don't have because you don't ask. And you don't receive because when you do ask, you ask wrongly to spend on your passions. And then he <laughs> insults them. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Now, why did he call them adulterous people? Did he say anything in verses 1 through 4 about sexual immorality? No. He's not talking about sexual adultery. He's talking about spiritual adultery, which is called idolatry. Remember Colossians chapter 3 verse 5? Open the sermon with it. He says, put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passions, and covetousness, which is idolatry. To desire that which you do not have and put your hope in it is to worship. And anytime you worship, you will always sacrifice. Whatever you place your hope in, whatever you covet, whatever you desire and you have the strongest desire for, whatever you are thinking, this will make my life meaningful, that is what you will sacrifice to and that is what you will bow to. And James is saying, that's idolatry. It's spiritual adultery. It's spiritual adultery. And it's the reason that you fight so much. Did a wedding last night. This couple does not have this problem Yet, they might. I don't know. We'll see. And that is one of the number one things that, that married couples uh, get into strife over is money. The lack thereof and debt and everything that is surrounding covetousness. And James is saying, why do you fight all the time? I'll, well, I'll, I'll tell you why you fight all the time. Because you want what you can't get and that person is preventing you from getting it. 
That's it. That's the explanation of every fight that's ever happened from Genesis chapter 4 until the present time. We want something and there's somebody preventing us or we perceive that they're preventing us from getting it. And in this case, you have a younger brother coming to Jesus, pointing to the older brother saying, he won't give me what's rightfully mine. There's strife, there's conflict in the family. And some of you know exactly how that works. You're experiencing strife and conflict within your own homes right now or within the workplace or within your neighborhoods. It's just, that's just humanity and, and you're used to it and you just think, well, that's just the way it is and that's the way, that, it's not the way, yeah, it is the way it is. It's not the way that it ought to be. Uh, and, and that's the effect of covetousness. Let's, let's deal with it now. Three things, three things in order to deal with covetous. Number one, you've got to know your heart. You got to know yourself, allow the Holy Spirit to search you and show you some uncomfortable things which you may not want to really admit are true. But if you do that, you come into the light, you can drag these things into the light and the blood of Christ can, can cleanse you and I, cleanse us from all sin. So first of all, you got to know your heart. Second of all, you got to know your father's heart. You will not be open and transparent and honest with your father about your own covetous nature if you don't believe that he is merciful and gracious, gracious and generous. You will not allow yourself to see yourself as a, as a vile sinner. You'll try to tell, talk yourself up and you won't be honest. And then lastly, after you know your father's heart and you've received the gospel, live by faith. So let's take those one at a time here. First of all, know your heart. Know your heart. Metaphorically speaking, if we are in the parable and we are the ones with the barn, this is a metaphor, not all of you have barn, some of you do, literally. What goes in your barn? What goes in your barn? In other words, when you talk to your soul about what's going to make you happy and what's going to give your life meaning, what do you say to your soul? Soul? soul, if you get blank, then you will be fulfilled. What goes in the blank for you? For some of you, it might be hard, cold cash. You just, just right out of the box. Some of you are like, I don't have an issue with money. But for you, it's what money buys. Oh, the boat, the motorcycle, the car, the bike, the vacation home, the bigger home, the motor home, the food, the dining out, the movies, the plasma screen, you get the idea. So in other words, you don't have an issue with money. It's just you want stuff that money happens to buy. For those others of you, it's really not about stuff and it's not about money so much. Such, maybe, maybe it's approval. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's the idea of security. You just want to know that you have enough so in case... In case something happens, in case I get old, like that's not going to happen, in case, in case, in case, in case, I just need, I just need enough to cover everything. Now, some of the financial planners are here, you're cutting into my business, you keep preaching like this, nobody's going to have retirement. That's a, well, we'll get to that, maybe. So, what is in the blank for you? What is in the blank for you? For me, I, I tend to, uh, I tend to, if I got money, it's burning a hole in my pocket. Uh, it was my birthday yesterday, and I got uh, some money from my parents for birthday present. Open up the cards. Oh, there's money. Immediately, immediately, it's like, I could spend it on this. And I get online, and I'm starting to, I'm starting to, to compare different bike computers. I like to bike. Uh, not, not vroom vroom, but this, this kind of bike. And I, I'm looking at these bike computers. Comparing the Garmin Edge 520 versus the Garmin 820 and all the pros and the cons and this and that. It's like 300 buck bike computer or so forth. And I'm, I'm like, I made the mistake of asking my wife what she thought. <laughs> I said, what do you think? And she's like, looks at me, totally innocent. Well, I thought your phone does all of that. Like, well, it does, just not as well. And it's not waterproof. And in other words, I, I knew immediately that this was not a need. I already have my needs met. I already have my needs met. It was a desire. And you know what? I didn't know that bike computer existed 
until I was watching a YouTube video where someone was talking about how awesome it was. I have to have that. I have to have that or I can't be complete. Soul, if you could get the Garmin Edge 520 or even the 820, then your life would be fulfilled. And the truth of the matter is, it was fulfilled before I knew that existed. (laughs) I was fine until I knew I didn't have it. So, because we have a wedding to pay for in three weeks and a lot of medical bills and insurance doesn't cover it, I decided to buy a helmet with that money. (laughs) so I could protect my cranium and not have a brain injury because I bike. That seemed much more practical, although not nearly as fun. Not nearly as fun. You get the idea. All of us do this. All of us do this. And then whatever is in your barn, and by the way, this could be solid, get your hands on tangible things, toys, money, assets. It could also be the intangibles. Your time. Your time. Uh, your, your talents, your intellectual abilities, that's what's in your barn. So what's the purpose of those things? A couple different things. One or two, you view it as my stuff is my stuff and the reason it exists is to bring me pleasure. That is an owner mentality. You, that's, the, that's the issue of the man who stored up for himself and tore down his barns and he's thinking only of himself. My grain is my grain and it exists for my pleasure. That was his problem. That was his problem. So this is an owner mentality. If you view your time as your time, if you view your resources as your resources, if you view your stuff as your stuff, and it never occurs to you that it might not be strictly yours, you're in danger and you're not guarding your heart against all covetousness. Now the flip side of that is to view your things as a steward as a steward. A steward says, my stuff is actually God's stuff and it exists to be used for his glory. Now that's not saying that God doesn't want you to enjoy the resources which he has given you on loan. It's not saying that you can't even have a bike computer. That's, it's, he's not saying, I forbid you to have fun things and do fun things and enjoy life. That's not at all. We learned that from Ecclesiastes. Solomon said, God gives us these things for our enjoyment. But that's not the purpose. It's not the sole purpose. The purpose is to use my time, my talents, my treasures, my stuff, my hobbies, so that I can bring him glory and advance his kingdom. And yes, enjoy myself in the process. One views it very narrowly as this is all mine. The other views it as God's and I'm to enjoy it, but I'm also to bless other people with it. That's why my truck, which was a gift from someone, is I see that as not really belonging to me. And that's why I have people ask me all the time, can I borrow your truck? And I say, yep. <laughs> but yes, you can borrow my truck. You can borrow my truck. It's, it's not my truck. It's God's truck. It's not my house. It's his house. It's not my income. It's his income. It's not my bike. It's his bike. And I'm to use it for his glory. See, you get the idea? They're not my kids. They're his kids. I'm to raise them for his glory. Fill in the blank. It's not my time. It's not my time. It's his. It's his. So you have to know your own heart. Which of those are you, uh, back to that, which do you lean towards? By the way, you can be a steward one minute and have a really, really good attitude and the next minute you're a grubby little miser. <laughs> and so it's not that you're always in one camp all the time. Right now at this moment, which do you tend to identify with? Okay, so if you, if you want to change, and some of you, quite honest, you don't want to. You're like, I checked out the moment you said, good morning. <laughs> I'm not listening. I don't want to be convicted. And, and there's, the Holy Spirit's going to have to get to your holy heart. But some of you, probably most of you are like, yeah, I want to follow Christ. I know that I need to grow and so forth. How do you grow? What do you do? You got to know your heart. You got to know where your sin issues are. And first of all, just be honest with God. Tell him, you know, God, man, that whole owner thing, that's totally how I view things. I know I shouldn't. I know I shouldn't, but that's how I do. I confess that to you. Lord, change my heart. So, you got to start with yourself, confessing what you know to be true about yourself, even if it's ugly. God already knows the ugliness of your heart. 
You're not hiding anything by not confessing it. You're just acknowledging what he already knows. That's why 1 John says, if uh, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That, that's what it just means. This is being honest with God about what he already knows uh, about you. Now you know it, just tell him that. And then he'll begin the transformation process. But to do that, you've got to know his heart. You've got to know his heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Little context here. This is uh, embedded in a couple chapters where Paul is telling the church in Corinth that the Macedonian church has been ridiculously generous even giving so much out of their poverty that they asked him if they could give more to relieve suffering Christians in Jerusalem where there was a famine going on. And he's saying, you guys ought to be like the Macedonians to give towards the cause of Christ, to advance the gospel and to take care of the needs of people. You should give so much that it cuts into your own well-being. And then he follows that with saying, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. In other words, he highlights the generosity of the Father. He highlights the generosity of Christ. He says, this is the God that you worship. Jesus, in being very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he took the form of a servant and became obedient and humble, even unto death. This is Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And here in 1 Corinthians, Christ being rich, owning, possessing everything, do all the glory that, that there is, emptied himself of his majesty and became a humble child in a manger to poor Jewish parents. He was not raised in a palace. He was raised in obscurity. He was raised in poverty and he emptied himself of his glory. He took on poverty and he took on my and your sin debt. Debt. The wages of sin, we talked about this last week when we talked about what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. That is what I deserve. That is what you deserve. That is what all humanity deserves. And he paid that sin debt. He became poor. He became poor. How did he become poor? He took on humanity, but he also took on our sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So there's two things happening here. Number one, when he takes on sin, he takes on my sin and he pays my debt and your debt. So he becomes poor in that sense that he takes on our debt. But it's more than that. He erases that debt. He pays that debt on the cross. The wrath of the Father is satisfied on the cross. He pays my sin and your sin. But he also, before the cross, fulfills the righteous requirements of the law. He fulfills all the righteous requirements of the law. And that righteousness, his merit, his accomplishments, that is imputed or gifted to us. So it's not just simply he takes my sin. Yes, he takes my sin, bears it, but then he says, here's my righteousness. Now when the Father looks at you, when the Father looks at me, those of us who have placed our faith by grace through faith in Christ, he sees not an impoverished, worthless sinner, but a rich child of God who has inherited the righteousness and all of Christ's glory. That's who you are now. That's who you are. You and I, regardless of the size of your bank account, are, are infinitely wealthy. Infinitely wealthy. You say, well, Brooks, I don't have any money. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You were created for eternity. And if you die right now or 70 years from now, the scope of your insignificant time on this earth pales in comparison with eternity in which you are an heir of all things in Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 1. You're an heir of all things in Christ. That means that you are exorbitantly wealthy. If it's Christ, it's yours. You've been made rich. So why are you worrying? 
Well, that's different. My inheritance in Jesus doesn't pay the bills, or does it? Or does it? Instead, seek his kingdom, Jesus says, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Um, here, Jesus is not anti-treasure. He's not anti-treasure. Jesus is not opposed to you amassing treasure. Jesus is not anti-treasure. He's anti-stupid. Let me explain anti-stupid. Anti-stupid is investing in something you know can't last. That's not wise. Jesus is all for you amassing treasure. Just do it somewhere where you'll actually be able to enjoy it. The fool amassed treasure in a way that after his death, he couldn't enjoy it. That's dumb. That's foolish. Why would you do that? How many of you are vaguely aware someday you might die? How many of you are all aware that you can't take your toys with you? Um, the shocking, sad reality is that 50% of you didn't raise your hand with either question. <laughs> I can't help you. Of course, I know that you're just like, I'm not raising my hand. You always ask me to do that. Stupid. I'm not a child. I'm not going to raise my hand. Fine. Fold your arms and look like this. <laughs> but one way or another, you're going to die. And you'll look like this in your casket. But you're not taking anything with you. You're just not going to take it with you. Jesus wants you to be able to enjoy how God used you in this life. But to do that, you've got to empty your barns. You got to empty your barns. You got to fling open the gates and say, you know what? The car, you can use it. It's there for you. I'm here to serve. The income, it's here to bring God glory. It's here to meet needs. The house, it's here to be, for me to be hospitable and invite people in. Everything that God has given me, my talents, my time, it's used to be used so that I can advance the kingdom. And if I do that, here's what Jesus says. Uh, don't, don't worry about the little things. Will you be able to, what am I going to eat? Where am I going to say? I'll take care of those things. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? Empty your barns, sell your possessions, give to the needy. The number one question I've had over the last 20 years whenever I preach on anything that touches close to what Jesus is saying here, whether we're talking about his words to the rich young ruler who says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and the whole rich can't, or it's harder for a camel to pass, harder for the rich in her kingdom heaven than it is for a camel to pass through night. Everybody wants to know, is Jesus telling me I should literally sell everything I have and give it to the poor? Is that literal? Is that literal? Is that literal? You know what I usually say? Well, that's, that's in that context. He's talking to this guy. You know what I say now? I don't know. Maybe you should ask him. <laughs> I am done telling people that God doesn't want them to do literally what he just told us to do. And you know what? I don't even like that verse. Because I have stuff in my barn that I don't want to share. <laughs> I want the Garmin Edge 520 for my very own. My precious. I want it. <laughs> I want it. I am coveting. You know, I had somebody after the first service come up to me and he says, I just got one. It's everything I thought it would be. <laughs> I literally put my hands around his throat. That's not even a metaphor. I did. I said, I hate you. It was Cain and Abel right there. I don't enjoy verse 33, but I need it. Because if I don't follow through with that, I am in bondage to the very things that I think I have to have. I've got to hear that Christ loves me so much that if I pry my grubby hands from what I think are my possessions and give them over to the Lord, I have to hear that, Brooks, I took care of your sin on the cross. I'll take 
care of the medical bills. Could you just trust me? Do you think, do you think if I gave you everything on the cross that I'm not going to take care of your necessities in this life? What kind of father do you think that I am? That's the question here. And if I really trust him, if I really trust him, I'm going to say, okay, okay, I'm going to seek first your kingdom. I don't need the bike computer, at least for now. <laughs> but oh Lord, I'm going to trust. I'm going to obey. Because you've given it all to me, I'm going to give myself to you as a living sacrifice. I'm going to trust you to take care of my needs. And then anxiety and the strife that covetousness calls, causes, those things dissipate. They move on. But you got to start with receiving Christ. If you have not received the gift of eternal life and the person and work of Jesus Christ, please don't empty your barns. Because here's what will happen if you do. You will think that emptying your barns causes God to give you merit. And he doesn't. That's not how it works. Christ has emptied himself of everything to give you life. It has to start there. It has to start with receiving the grace of God through the, the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So if you haven't received Christ as your Savior, today, right now, confess your sins. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And you died on the cross for me. Save me from my sins. Give me the Holy Spirit. Make me the man or woman or child that you created me to be. Wash me, cleanse me, make me yours. And you know what he says? I, done. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on him right now. And those of you who have called, step out in obedience, fling the barn doors open, recognize that the gifts, the time, the talent, the treasure that he's given you, they belong to him to be used by you for his glory and enjoyed by you. And live for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your generosity. And Lord, the truth of the matter is that we are all like that young guy that came to you. We want what we have and we want just a little bit more. And we're worried that what we have is going to depart from us and we're worried that what we don't have, we'll never have. Father, help us to be content and satisfied in you. And Lord, help us to trust you, to seek first your kingdom. Lord, show us what you would have us do with the resources and the gifts and the time and the talent and the treasure that you've given us. Show us the needs in the community, in our families, in the local church, uh, global missions. Lord, show us how you want us to invest the things and, the, and the, the resources which you've entrusted to us so that we might advance your kingdom so that you might be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless, go in grace. We'll see you next week.